Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our board, Metro Board activities for July 14, 2022. We'll start the day with a brief safety contact from our Chief Safety Officer, Ms. Teresa Impostato. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, biking is a great way to get around or enjoy a recreational ride. Sometimes you'll need to take your bike on the train or the bus to connect between a metro stop and your destination. Some guidance for the public includes when taking your bike on metro rail, take the elevator down to the platform for your own safety and those around you. Do not use your bike on an escalator. Do not ride bicycles in stations on platforms or on trains. When the train arrives, wait for everyone to get off before attempting to board with a bicycle. Middle cars are usually the most crowded, so consider boarding the first or last car and use the end doors rather than the center door. While on the train, do your best to avoid blocking aisles and doors. Bikes are welcome on Metro Rail during all hours of operation, except during special events or other days when crowding is anticipated. Even still, we recommend avoiding rush hour if at all possible. If it's not possible, remember to be patient and don't try to squeeze onto a crowded train with a bicycle. When taking a bike on Metro Bus, you can transport your bike free aboard Metro Bus using the heavy duty bicycle racks attached to the front of each bus. Up to two bicycles can be stored in each rack. The racks have a locking mechanism to, present, to prevent bicycles from coming loose. For safety purposes, buses have special mirrors that allow our bus operators to see the bicycle racks as well as riders loading bicycles. When riding the bus, keep an eye on your bike. Try to sit near the front of the bus. When near or approaching your stop, remind the bus operator that you're retrieving your bike from the bicycle rack. If there are any issues, see a station manager or bus operator with any bike transportation safety concerns. For more information on transporting your bike on the Metro system, visit WMATA.com. This concludes our safety contact. Thank you, Ms. Impostato, and welcome to today's Safety and Operations Committee. Uh, since this is our first public meeting of the day, I'll ask Ms. Elliott, uh, our board corporate secretary, to call the roll. Thank you, Chair Drummer. Present. Mr. Smedberg. Chair Smedberg. Dr. Lowe. Can you hear everyone? Present. Mr. Zappi. Present. Ms. Klein. Present. Mr. Letourneau. Present. Okay, is it good? And Mr. Smedberg. Present. Thank you. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Ellison. Our first order of business is to approve the agenda. If there are no objections, we'll consider the agenda approved as presented. Are there any objections by members of the committee? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. Now to approval of our minutes. We have the minutes of our June 9th committee meeting. Are there any objections to the minutes as presented? Hearing none, we'll consider the minutes approved as well. So we have two information updates uh, from our chief safety officer on the agenda this morning. First, we'll receive a mid-year progress report on the development and implementation of our safety management system, also known as SMS. And this will be followed by an update on the status of training and certification for our rail operators and supervisors, for our rail traffic controllers, and for our bus operators. And this update will also include ongoing actions and plans to improve oversight and compliance. I'll now turn the floor over to Ms. Impostato. Where's Ms. Impostato? All right, Teresa went down and she's going to back up. Here's her audio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to confirm that my slides are displayed. We can see them. Thank you. I'm pleased to present to the board the progress that Metro has made to date this year implementing a safety management system. The status of each of the pillars of our SMS will be reviewed at the mid-year point and the path forward will also be reviewed. To begin our review, I'd like to reiterate Metro's SMS strategy, which includes aligning the organization around our vision, mission and the strategic and tactical steps we're taking to move our vision and mission 
from rhetoric to reality. In order for us to be successful in this endeavor, we must be transparent in our efforts and continuously self-assess against our goals to ensure we're on target and achieving the results we expect. This slide depicts the SMS roadmap that Metro shared with the board in January and updates our progress made thus far, implementing the tactical action plans to support each strategic milestone. As we've continued throughout our implementation journey, We've also refined and expanded our 2023 and beyond plans to reflect our progress and to better predict our needs in 2023. Of note, all milestones from the 2021 roadmap were fully completed with the exception of the safety department reorganization, which we'll discuss in a few moments. Metro's made substantial progress implementing the required actions to achieve our milestones in each of the four pillars of the SMS. The remainder of this presentation will review the achievements thus far and will forecast the remainder of 2022. As we review each pillar, items with a check mark have achieved milestone completion status, and in progress items are denoted with stoplight criterion. Green targets are fully on target for completion by calendar year end. Yellow items are behind schedule at the mid year, but are planned to recover by year end. Red items are at risk for completion by year end. With regard to the safety policy, Metro began calendar year 2022 with the latest annual revision of our agency safety plan approved and taking effect. The ASP is reviewed and revised on an annual cycle with the latest revision well underway, including new requirements from the bipartisan infrastructure law, more information regarding our strategy with MITRE and other improvements. This draft is currently under review by the WMSC, our safety oversight agency, Metro's Joint Labor Management Safety Committee, and our executive leadership team. We've completed a courtesy review of our plan with the Federal Transit Administration's Technical Assistance Center with no findings. The agency safety plan will be brought to the board in the fall for consideration and approval. Additionally, We've revised Metro's safety policy instruction document to align with SMS principles and issued the revised policy to staff. When we set about developing our strategy to implement an SMS in late 2020, we quick, quickly realized that we would need to realign and augment the safety department in order to effectively guide and support this effort. Metro's vision to lead the transit industry in safety would require building a safety department with greater depth and breadth of experience than the industry norm. This effort required a complete realignment of job descriptions, significant investment in training and development of internal existing safety staff, and extensive recruiting of staff to increase the diversity of skills and experience on the Metro safety team. I'm proud to report that safety's partnership with our HR team has resulted in targeted recruiting of staff from multiple high reliability industries with significant SMS experience, such as healthcare, aviation, defense, and oil and gas production. Additionally, we've recruited staff to key roles with experience in safety and emergency response regulation, investigation and oversight, heavy construction, military logistics, law enforcement, manufacturing, academia, and research pursuits. Reimagining the role of a safety organization and finding the skills, knowledge, and abilities required to implement an SMS at Metro has had its challenges. And recruiting this type of rare talent in the current market has proven difficult. We're projecting that we will complete the reorganization by year end and are meeting twice weekly with our partners in HR to accelerate the reorganization. Lastly, we are partnering with operations and information technology to create a technology evaluation framework that can be applied as part of Metro's IT governance board to better evaluate safety implications of emergent technologies. The first pilot of this framework will concern our implementation of automated inspection system technology that utilizes machine visioning for our 7000 series fleet. We're on track to complete the framework and the pilot by year end.
With regard to safety risk management, we've initiated corrective actions for improving workplace safety programs. We've implemented a hearing conservation program, which closed a longstanding corrective action plan in March of this year. We're continuing to develop and improve our workplace safety programs by staffing occupational safety and health teams and implementing an internal action plan. We've implemented on schedule with a corrective action plan to improve our safety certification program, receiving positive feedback from the Washington Metro Rail Safety Commission. Additionally, with regard to safety certification, in anticipation of the 10-year capital plan, a full revision of our safety and security certification program plan to advance integration with multiple strategic partners throughout Metro is underway. With regard to the Metro Rail Safety Standards Manual, nine of 11 standards that will compromise the manual have been approved by the Rail Safety Standards Committee, with the remaining standards on track to be completed this summer. Standards include items such as rail terminology, radio procedures, station management processes, evacuations, and other critical safety instructions. Uh, standard operating procedures and training are being refreshed to align with the new safety standards, and this work will continue over the remainder of this year with communication training and implementation occurring in calendar year 2023. The refreshed Roadway Worker Protection Standard has been established based on railroad industry best practices and standard operating procedures that align to the standard. It's currently under review with our Rail Safety Standards Committee. Additionally, we're going to work to continue to implement new SOPs for each of the required actions of our Roadway Worker okay. Protection Program. A complete system-wide security focused threat and vulnerability assessment to determine threats, vulnerabilities, and potential consequences to overall systems and properties is scheduled to be completed by the end of September of this year. The safety team has initiated targeted discussions with work groups on the threat of power communications outages, as well as cyber attacks. The scope of these assessments also includes close collaboration with the Metro Transit Police Department to assure the security of critical infrastructure and assets from deliberate attacks by groups or individuals with malicious intent. The Office of Emergency Preparedness is, is currently participating in a working group to develop the Metropolitan Washington Council of Government's National Capital Region Threat and Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment, otherwise known as THERA which will be completed by September of this year. Additionally, the Office of Emergency Preparedness is meeting with a team from FEMA to begin a public transit risk assessment methodology. WMATA is the first public transit agency to undergo this assessment in collaboration and partnership with FEMA. Metro has been successful in applying for transit security grant programs to fund and assist with the development and conduct of a three-year exercise program. Additionally, we're partnering with our IT team to investigate the feasibility of conducting a comprehensive evaluation of critical safety systems that leverages the National Institute of Standards and Technology Standards for cybersecurity and system resiliency. All of that, our actions with regard to the corporate risk and threat analysis remain on track for completion by the end of the year. With regard to safety risk management, since our pilot with the Rail Operations Control Center, We've baselined our process and have been expanding it throughout operations. However, expansion of the safety risk management process has been slower than expected, primarily due to resource constraints associated with the challenges of recruiting in the reorganization. I'm pleased to report that we have initiated hiring for two uh, safety risk management program specialists that will be joining the Metro team this month and they're expected to accelerate the rollout uh, and return to schedule by end of the year. In 2021, we piloted the safety risk management process with our Rail Operations Control Center, then expanded the effort to include our supply chain, warehousing, and logistics teams. We're now implementing the safety risk management processes in our rail transportation teams, concentrating on station managers and train operators. The current process is in the analysis phase with the teams, and we anticipate building targeted mitigation plans to reduce residual risk over the coming months. The data from this safety risk management process is being fed into the system that Metro developed for the ROC and our supply chain team, and will also include interactive dashboarding of progressive mitigation plans, as well as standardized and custom reports. 
Metro safety risk management dashboards and the data associated with them are available for review by all staff and are reviewed by safety risk coordinators on a monthly basis. Management reviews these dashboards via Metro's Executive Safety Committee. Several thematic elements emerged in the risk identification efforts with the two teams, including concerns with operator certifications, mobile work crews, radio communications, yard conditions, a perception that safety reporting leads to negative consequences and assaults. These themes comport with known issues and findings of internal and external assessments, and we are currently working to prioritize strategic actions to mitigate these, these themes and reduce risk. With regard to the third pillar of safety assurance, I reported to the board on the progress of building the Operation Safety Oversight Team. Led by a director with significant experience in transit safety of all modes, the historically siloed bus, rail, and construction oversight teams were integrated. The Operations Safety Oversight Team now reports monitoring status daily as part of our Chief Operating Officer's daily operating rhythm. They also perform targeted data-driven oversight and continue to standardize oversight processes and inspections. Our next steps include development of an integrated safety inspection process that will include standardized reports and field applications, in partnership with our quality improvement team on inspection alignments. Additionally, we're working to improve communications with operations, including sharing checklists and establishing a process and system to follow up on recommended corrective actions for oversight findings. The Mission Assurance Coordinator has been established in the Rail Operations Control Center as a 24-7, 365 position. Although the Mission Assurance Coordinator works geographically in the Rail Operations Control Center, the position represents the Chief Safety Officer for all incidents within the authority, rail, bus, metro access, and facilities. The Mission Assurance Coordinator assists the Rail Operations Control and Bus, bus Operations Control to not only prop properly categorize the severity of an incident, but also to assure coordination of the appropriate response to incidents as an independent layer of oversight. This role has been established to provide highly trained and experienced personnel to support deployment of resources and coordination within operations control centers. These critical functions are within the incident management framework that's currently under development and planned for implementation in the fall of 2022. The reorganization has resulted in the recruiting of an expanded investigation team with diverse experience in the many facets of investigation. This team has begun coordinating and conducting root cause and corrective action analysis in coordination with the chief operating officer. We've also incorporated fatigue analysis and are on target to complete the expansion of the investigations process to establish parity across all modes and incorporate just culture principles into our investigations. Metro recently shared our experience and lessons learned in enhancing our safety assurance capabilities and building out our program with our industry colleagues at the recent After Rail conference. We're on target to deliver our, to deliver our incident management framework in the fall of 2022. The team has developed guidance, operating procedures, and training to ensure that Metro manages incidents with urgency, consistency, and flexibility and that all key players know their roles and responsibilities. This effort will progress a number of corrective actions necessary to improve our incident preparedness, management, and response capabilities. Lastly, Metro has established our Joint Labor and Management Safety Committee, which kicked off last month. This committee meets the requirements of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act and will be used to oversee the development of an improved employee safety reporting program. Our committee charter required modifications to comply with the IIJA, which resulted in a slight delay. However, we are on target to complete our efforts by year end and have surpassed the deliverable requirements embedded for standing up of the committee within the bill. With regard to the final pillar of safety promotion, we're on target with our two action plans for the year. MITRE, the safety team, and the operations team are currently working on mobilization planning to assess Metro safety culture. That'll include focus groups, targeted interviews, and a safety survey. Interviews have begun, 
focus groups are established and the survey is scheduled to launch in September. We'll receive the results before year end and it will inform our actions moving forward. The Joint Labor Management Safety Committee will be a key part of supporting the survey and the response to the findings. We're also well underway in drafting an expanded SMS communications, training, and engagement strategy, which will inform many of our 2023 and 2024 promotional activities. Moving forward, Metro will continue to apply a project management approach to SMS and will provide ongoing updates and detailed reports of our actions. This concludes my presentation and I'm happy to address any of the board's questions. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Impostato. We really appreciate the systems approach and the uh, comprehensive focus. Standing by for any questions that committee members might have first, and then we'll follow up with other board members. Seeing none from committee members, are there any board members that have uh, any questions? Thank you very much. Seeing none, uh, we'll move to your second presentation. Sorry, I appear to be having difficulties getting the presentation to share. I will reload it in just a moment. Thank you. I'd like to confirm that the slides are visible. Looks good. This presentation will review the status of Metro's training and certification for employees who perform, who perform safety related duties. We will roll through um, some background information as well as the results of the investigation, the process that we followed, our findings, current status and recommendations and activities that are underway. By way of background, in April of 2022, a WMSC audit identified that Metro Rail was not meeting train operator refresher training and, recertif and recertification requirements. This launched an independent investigation conducted by the Metro Safety Department. The investigation discovered that multiple blanket waivers were issued from March of 2020 through December of 2021, resulting in 257 train operators that were out of compliance with required certifications. 72 of those train operators were greater than one year out of compliance and were subsequently removed from service for retraining activities as an accelerated plan to bring operators back into compliance was initiated. By way of background, train operators complete an initial qualification course followed by refresher training and recertification every 24 months. Refresher training is facilitated by the Rail Operations Quality Training Team under the Operations Management Services Office. Certification um, by that team, it takes a total of five days and includes a combination of classroom training as well as uh, practical certification. And an independent investigation was launched by the safety team with a focus on fact finding, not fault finding. This investigation performed a series of records reviews, timeline reviews, and conducted interviews with involved staff to determine probable causes as well as potential contributing factors that led to the lapse in certification. A records review indicated that a waiver process existed for over 10 years, as documented in the Office of Rail Transportation's Performance Standardization Program Manual, most recently revised in June of 2020. The Performance Standardization Program Manual is authorized under the authority of the operations team. 
It allows for individual waivers to be issued for 30 day extensions by the operations support manager and approved by the vice president of rail transportation. Any waivers that were issued beyond the 30 days would require new certificates be, be pursued. Looking at the timeline leading to the incident, uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic, we were able to find records of six individual waivers which were issued. The first blanket waiver for train operator recertification was issued in March of 2020 and training was suspended. Training was resumed in September of 2020 at a reduced rate. Training was suspended again in October of 2021. At that time, an additional blanket waiver was granted and the last blanket waiver was issued in December of 2021, uh, scheduled to run through June of 2022. The safety department performed interviews with involved staff in the operations department, as well as departments outside of operations. We were unable to confirm any departments outside of operations that were aware of waivers or the training status. With regard to findings, Metro's operator training and certification program follows the relevant APTA standards and recommended practices. Its structure and content comport with the APTA standard. In response to pandemic related restrictions, including limitations on gathering size, multiple Metro processes required modification beginning in March of 2020. These modifications were brought before Metro's pandemic task force, which is chaired by the safety department and includes an interdisciplinary team tasked with responding to and altering guidance or policies as the pandemic evolved. In response to modifications to process that were brought to the pandemic task force, any issues with regard to required training or safety critical inspection intervals were referred to Metro's Rail Safety Standards Committee, which governs rules and procedures. A review of the certification of employees who perform safety related duties identified that all other pandemic related waivers were no longer active. A number of waivers were granted through the Rail Safety Standards Committee, which extended training deadlines as well as modified requirements for face-to-face -face and in-person training to facilitate a use of computerized and technological resources. Additionally, reviews regarding inspection intervals and maintenance practices as well as work practices were all conducted uh, by the Rail Safety Standards Committee and reported back to the Pandemic Task Force. An exhaustive review of the Pandemic Task Force meeting minutes from 2020 through current did not indicate any evidence that a discussion regarding training and certification timelines or waivers for rail transit operators took place. The investigation determined that the decision to issue a waiver for rail operators was made entirely within operations at the level of the senior vice president of rail and the chief operating officer beginning in March of 2020. Subsequent decisions to continue reissuing the waivers also were made within operations. With regard to external and internal independent oversight, the most recent internal safety review conducted by Metro's quality team regarding recertification was conducted in 2018. Internal safety reviews are conducted on a rotating basis in order to maximize the amount of time between internal and external reviews of our programs. At the time in 2018, there were no issues noted with recertification and compliance with the program was strong. Certifications are tracked in Metro's Electronic Learning Management Module, or ELM. The data in ELM was not up to date due to the waivers. Additionally, staff perform manual queries with ELM and prepare reports on a manual basis. Staffing constraints due to absenteeism associated with the COVID-19 pandemic and scheduling issues with the 7000 series fleet exacerbated the challenges with keeping up to date with train operator certifications. 
independent oversight of the training and certification function was immature as Metro is relatively green in our journey with SMS. All of these findings are underpinned by a significant finding that the processes for training and certification are decentralized throughout Metro and require coordination between multiple departments within operations, which can result in gaps and issues emerging. With regard to current status, 58% uh, of the backlog has been completed since being identified in May of 2022. Metro's corrective action plan for rail operators and supervisors will be completed by September of this year. We took a look at other employees who perform safety related duties to ensure that we did not have similar concerns with gaps or issues. With regard to Metro's rail traffic controllers, 28 certifications were required to have been completed since May of 2022. All have been completed. With regard to Metro's bus operators, 190 refresher training sessions were required to be completed since May of 2022, with all being completed. Approximately 99 plus percent of Metro's bus operators are fully requalified, refreshed, and recertified. Additionally, moving forward, all recertifications are going to be proactively realigned to balance resources and ensure consistent documentation. We'll be recertifying individuals who perform safety related duties in advance of their recertification expiration dates in order to properly space and meter the needs for recertification and staffing. With regard to the immediate actions that have been taken, any potential deviations from existing training and certification plans are required to be reviewed and recorded by the Metro Safety Standards Committee without exception. This includes the recovery plan for rail train operators. The Rail Safety Standards Committee approved recovery plan is being monitored daily with reports being escalated to the leadership team at Metro. As I mentioned, additional certifications are being conducted to proactively balance the population and training and certification status has been added as a quarterly review item at Metro's Executive Safety Council. We've partnered with our IT team to automate queries and send reports of certification status to a broad audience in advance of any certification expirations. Ongoing in process actions include taking a holistic approach as part of our SMS efforts. This includes an evaluation of the organizational design of the functions of training and certification, as well as improvement of independent oversight through data sharing and establishing key performance indicators, as well as conducting evaluations with regard to potentially dedicating a portion of the fleet for training and developing a simulator program for training and recertification. This holistic review has already begun, and we are working on benchmarking against relevant regulations and requirements, including those of other industries. This concludes my update on the progress of Metro's training and certification investigation, and I'm happy to address any questions the board may have. Uh, thank you again, Ms. Impostato. Uh, the uh, background was quite enlightening. Uh, we appreciate the transparency on our current status and the progress and ongoing corrective actions are very inspiring. And I'll move to questions. Dr. Lowe. Hi, yeah, I'd just like to echo that um, this is a great presentation. This is very informative and helped us understand, you know, uh, how what happened happened and and what we're going to do about it. I think this is transparency that the board needs, but also that we owe the public. So thank you very much for a very, very clear presentation. Um, I specifically have a question about the second suspension of training that happened in October of 2021. You identify really clearly in the presentation that that happened um, at the SVP of rail and COO level. What I don't understand is like, I don't need anyone to tell me why such a decision like that would have been made in March of 2020. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's clear. 
but I don't understand why it was done again in October of 2021. And frankly, I'm ext- I'm suspicious. Do you have you uncovered in your investigation any explanation for why the blanket waiver was renewed a second time? Yes. Uh Post the derailment of the 7,000 series trains, the decision was made to halt the training. One of the required components of the recertification is demonstration utilizing 7,000 series equipment. Uh, There was a perception that the priority was to support in the immediate, the investigation. Um, But as we progressed forward, Um, With our various return to service plans, the direction of the chief operating officer was to concentrate on the return to service plans and to deprioritize supplying additional train sets for training purposes. Uh, From a factual basis, there was no prohibition at any time as a result of the Washington Metro Rail Safety Commission's order on using 7,000 series equipment for training and certification services. Uh, So there was no need to suspend the training due to any external action. Uh, The decision appears to have been made in terms of prioritizing the resources of the operations team. Okay, it's obviously easy to Monday morning quarterback these things, but Um, What I'm hearing is that decision was wrong. And the only reason that at the time no one pointed out that it was wrong is because um, a limited number of people even knew the decision had been made. Does that sound right to you? That's correct. At the time the second suspension took place, uh, that was not communicated through any of Metro's multiple mechanisms to communicate that. It was not raised to the Executive Safety Council, nor the Rail Safety Standards Committee, nor brought up in our normal hazard risk management process. We found no evidence of the of communication of that decision outside of the operations team. And no whistles blown, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's, this is where this becomes, like, it is not the board's job to like get into every little thing. But this is where this does become our job. We need to like understand the org chart implications of the fact that that was able to happen and we we need to that we need to make changes of it other than just who is the COO <laughs> in order to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Right. This can't just be like a people thing. It also needs to be like a process thing, just just to call out a word from the current slide. So do we have uh, have we identified yet the, the process reforms that we think would prevent this kind of thing from happening again? Or is that an, an action item that the board needs to keep on its agenda? We have identified a number of process improvements that establish independent reviews and checks and balances. Um, We are in the process of automating those reports, which would force the disclosure of any lapses, concerns, or issues. And we've added it as a standing agenda item to a number of uh, multidisciplinary meetings that will include escalation and review up to the senior levels at Metro. Additionally, we're also communicating the lessons learned from our investigation to encourage employees to start shifting their mindset towards looking at anything that's going to deviate from the norm and raising that as a concern or issue. I want to extend a lot of sympathy to every employee on the planet, inside and outside of WMATA, who have felt like things that have happened in the last three years have not been the norm. We're we're all going through a lot, and and we have to figure out this new a new normal. But I, I that is reassuring to me to because I I don't love the the force word choice. I mean I realize that may technically be accurate, but this isn't about 
you know, coercion. This is a this is a, just a good check and balance type structure, which in an organization the size of WMATA we need. So that's a, that sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Mr. Smedberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Teresa, I too appreciate the transparency on this because this is the one issue that is really resonated across the board in terms of riders, our funding jurisdictions, you know, every, everyone. I mean, it's really, uh, uh, you know, appreciated that we're, we're shining a light on this. Um, I actually found the report pretty disturbing, um, actually, that there was such a breakdown, uh, you know, when it came to this. Um, and um, and I and I hope the people that were a part of it understand how how really bad this was um, and how bad it looked. Um, Tracy asked my question about the why, uh, you know, and how that second uh, deferral, if you will, took place. But and and I know you don't you you said and stated there there was no evidence, which I assume means there are no emails or any kind of paper trail that you could fall back on to see who knew what, when, and why. And or, but I, I I guess my question is, did you get any sense that there was anyone within the organization that pushed back at all? Um, you know that really said, hey, this you know, maybe we should rethink this or, 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 you know, this isn't right. Was there anyone that did that or was it just acceptance across the board that, okay, this is the way it's going to be because a person made this decision? We interviewed uh, the frontline up through senior vice president um, of, rail, of rail transportation as well as the senior vice president of rail and talked through all of the decision making processes and how often this was reviewed within operations. And I can say that uh, we were pleased with the level of cooperation that we received from all of those individuals, um, the level of candor that they expressed discussing this uncomfortable situation is really admirable. They did make clear to us that within the operations team, they had expressed discomfort with the delays associated with the training and that they were taking steps to attempt to draft plans to catch up. They would continually raise this concern and issue with the leadership and operations, but it was not found to be a priority in terms of all of the actions that the operation te operations team was directed to take. I think moving forward, as part of our lessons learned in this investigation, we've got a lot of growth and positive relationship building that's come out of this. That individuals, I think, no longer feel that they are beholden to the organizational hierarchy within their specific org unit. And I think they understand that this is a prime example of an organizational accident and something that an SMS seeks to prevent. And we've already noted increased communication and increased collaboration throughout middle management uh, of operations as a result of the investigation and ongoing discussions and actions. So, so you think there were lessons learned? Do you think, um, is there a general level of confidence in the the senior management within rail uh, that let this happen, you know, we, you know, they didn't say anything. They may have maybe expressed something, but there's no, again, no paper trail or no evidence of it. I mean, I, I what about the front line and middle, middle level workers? I mean, this has got to be, you know, concerning to them as well that their leadership. I mean, I, is, is there confidence there that these people can continue to lead the division in a in a serious way. Based upon the discussions that we've had with frontline employees, I think there was a sense of disappointment that the lapses had occurred. But I do think that most individuals recognized 
that the lapses that had occurred were unacceptable and that moving forward, there would there, they would not have a similar situation take place. I think uh, frontline staff were heartened to see immediate reactions and responsivity to their concerns and issues in an ongoing fashion. So I do think that the actions that Metro has taken are demonstrating the commitment that the leadership team and operations has to fixing the issue at hand and ensuring resilience so that a similar issue does not manifest. Yeah, and that and that's important, Teresa. And I really appreciate as chair and 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 I know the board does that. You brought this to our attention immediately. You know, I was initially concerned about the lack of urgency by some of the leadership on this issue, uh, given how this would be perceived. Um, so really appreciate that from the beginning. Um, moving forward, one thing I, I mentioned that, and I think this is a larger issue that we'll we'll deal with with the new general manager, and it's you know, a, and, and with your office, uh, key performance measures. You know, moving forward, that something like this will be now part of a, an ongoing report did I I think I read that uh, in one of the documents is that correct yes sir right now this will be part of one of your reports that you bring forward yeah yes we're anticipating as part of our um, enterprise-wide holistic assessment for training developing a suite of metrics relative to training and certification of employees that perform safety related duties with this specific exemplar um, being one of the first that we're now working to acquire data to support key performance indicators, goal setting, and taking a data-driven approach to decision making. And um, one last question, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Teresa, organizationally, um, is there anything that uh, your learning or any takeaways from you and your team that should your office be more integrated into operations or have some sort of um, different kind of interaction with that group maybe? Are we learning anything there? Um, um, you know, sort of bigger picture down the road. Um, are there any takeaways there? So from your for perspective? me, yeah, for, for me and my team, I think we, we've identified both systems issues with regard to process, as well as issues with regard to culture and relationship building. Yeah. Um, you, you know, Metro is a complex system, a system of systems, and each system works independent of one another, but are all interconnected. And we've observed historically significant siloing and breakdowns between each of the subsystems um, that comprise the whole of Metro's operation. And this specific issue has really driven home and highlighted the challenges that are not only part of the organizational structures, but also part of the embedded practices and culture uh, at Metro. And we've been working collaboratively with a number of operations leaders to break down those silos and reimagine the role for safety in the organization and to really take a systems approach to the management of risk. I think we've identified a number of opportunities that we need to study further to determine which best practices would be particularly adaptable to the metro environment. The organizational design specifically is something that we're looking at very closely throughout not only the transit industry, but the transportation industry in general. I think there's a lot of opportunity for improvement in how Metro organizes and structures itself to perform training and to oversee the function of ongoing certification. And I think the safety team um, has been hard at work to gain that knowledge and share that with our colleagues in operation. Um, I anticipate that we will have a fully fledged improvement plan for training and certification that'll encompass um, the entirety of the enterprise needs with regard to training and certification at Metro. 
uh, that will be in the coming months. And I'll be happy to update the board on those findings and changes that we've made to improve our, our processes. Yeah, I thank you, Teresa, and I, I definitely agree with that. And Mr. Chair, I think we should definitely get a follow up. I, I know you're probably thinking about, about that already, but uh, I think we definitely should get a follow up. And I know you and your team have done a lot of work in this area and you know trying to integrate in and uh, appreciate that. And I hope moving forward that people on the operations side and particularly within rail see the importance of this. So thank you for your work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Smedberg. Uh, next uh, question. And that point is a uh, part of our cultural change uh, perhaps needs to include the acceptance of the fact that safety is a comprehensive responsibility of everyone in the organization by department. And the safety staff is in the business of providing oversight and support of the preparation and execution of safety. And if we can continue to focus there and not point all arrows to safety has to make this happen, yeah. I believe uh, the SMS is really gonna help us uh, make some tremendous progress. Very cool. Mr. Letourneau. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Drummer. Um, well, when we have a discussion like this in a public forum, um, Metro can be kind of damned if it does and damned if it doesn't because it's sure to generate new headlines and new discussions but i'm glad we're doing it um you know we, we talk a lot about a lot of these issues in closed session because they involve specific personnel and things like that that are just not appropriate um and so i think sometimes the public doesn't doesn't know the extent to which the board is actually having a lot of these conversations around safety um but given what happened here and given the incredible public interest in it, I'm glad that we are doing this after re report um, in a public session. Um, just to confirm, the SVP of rail that is currently in that role is not the same person um, that was uh, during this time period, correct? That's correct. During the initial um, waiver decision, there was a different individual that occupied that role. The current SVP of rail uh, took that role in 2021. OK, um, so I wanted to get at actually building a little bit of uh, uh, on what Mr. Drummer just said. So, um, you know, I come I come at this from local government. And, and one of the things we have oversight of in my board of supervisors is our fire rescue system. And I'm very familiar with the concept of a safety officer as being the individual who is uh, responding to a fire incident or an EMS incident um, whose job it is to sort of almost stand on the sideline and be solely focused on the safety of the firefighters in the public that are at that scene, as opposed to actually fighting the fire. Um, and I've, you know, I've been to many different fire scenes and stood with the battalion chiefs and watched all this unfold, which is a real incredible thing to watch. Um, your title is also safety officer. And I've th always thought of your position as somewhat similar. Um, it seems to me that the challenge is, you know, unlike in my analogy, you know, there isn't necessarily a single incident that we're responding to. It's an organizational daily thing that happens. And so as a result, you can be out of the loop on something without knowing it. And your office can be out of the loop. And that seems like what happened here. You know, you, I, I know that you didn't know about this. And when you found out, you know, you took it to the highest level of management and then to the board. Um, how do we and this is maybe somewhat of a you know asking kind of the same question, but how how do we fix that? How do we get to the point where um, either, as Mr. Drummer said, everybody in the organization is focused on safety, or at least that the safety office is consulted and you are involved in any decision that could possibly impact safety? So I, I think the real key to that is going to be rolling out our SMS. Um, if we had a mature and fully functioning SMS, this issue would have been presented not just to the safety department, but to other key stakeholders would have been examined, reviewed, assessed, and there would have been a structured mitigation and risk reduction plan put in place. It would have been communicated throughout the agency to all involved. It would have also been tracked and logged to ensure that we were compliant with all of the requirements of assuring safety when we were deviating from our process. Um, so I think 
on a long enough timeline implementing our SMS, Metro will get there. Um, where we struggle right now and need to direct resources is to shoring up the understanding of individuals of the role of the safety team. Um, uh, we've had a history as an organization of having the safety team at Metro play a punitive role in the organization. And that is something that we've had to overcome. We've come a long way and have done a lot of work in reimagining the role of the safety department. And I think that that's shifting the organizational value for the safety team. I think we need to, in, in parallel with working to build relationships, structure into our processes, checks and balances that require engagement with the safety department. Um, right now, there are a lot of boundaries in our process that don't really reflect the boundaryless purview of a safety department. And that's something that in 2023 and in 2024, we're gonna be working very extensively through our quality management system and through our process overhauls to start building in those formal checks and balances that will require review, approval, and sign off while also in tandem building those relationships that are key um, in order to ensure compliance with those processes. Um, to the point about the sort of punitive nature, I mean, I can understand that delicate balance because obviously there are consequences at times when things happen and, and, and it's it's really clear that somebody didn't do what they shouldn't do. But at the same time, we want to encourage our employees throughout the organization to come forward, to engage with the safety office, to you know inform their supervisors, to, you know, to do the things that they should do when they see something or are aware of something that isn't quite right. Um, even if they're not sure. Um, so that culture, it seems like is really key. So I, I mean, I, I think the board certainly supports everything you're 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 doing and everything you're working toward, both with the long term SMS, but I think in the short term, obviously, we're running this system every day. You know, we've got to make sure that the message is getting out uh, across the organization that that's got to be the top priority. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Letourneau. And, and I'll just take this opportunity, Teresa, perhaps you can reinforce something that's working through our SNS process, and that is the creation of these uh, small groups throughout the organization at multiple levels uh, that address safety and keep safety at the forefront. Can you just kind of give an overview of, of how that's what that is? Absolutely. So uh, first and foremost, Metro has always been working to build as part of our SMS. A, a forum for gathering thoughts, feedback, and undertaking improvement actions between management and our labor organizations. Um, we were already in process when the bipartisan infrastructure law came into play. We reformulated to ensure ultimate compliance um, with that requirement, but have stood up a committee that is comprised of equal parts metro management across the organization across all modes and metro labor organizations across the organization across all modes to regularly review safety performance to raise safety concerns and issues to review our goals and our metrics and our agency safety plan and to work tightly in collaboration uh, with metro leadership and MITRE to improve our employee safety reporting programs. So that committee um, is sanctioned by Metro's Executive Safety Committee and provides updates um, on their progress, on concerns or issues uh, beginning in August at Metro's Executive Safety Committee meeting. Additionally, we have multiple structures of local and divisional safety committees that involve frontline employees as well as first and second level management to facilitate discussions um, and exchange of critical safety information. Uh, we have safety risk coordinators that are members of each department that meet once per month to review concerns and issues that are raised in the safety risk management process. So we've really built a framework 
um, of multiple tiers of opportunities for employees to engage in the identification and management of hazards or concerns throughout their day-to-day -day operation. And we've formalized that structure to ensure that we're acting on in a transparent and traceable manner, the concerns and issues that are brought before Metro and are escalating that up to our leadership team as needs and requirements dictate. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Uh, this certainly reinforces the power of a systems approach. Ms. Klein. Uh, yes, thank you. Actually, that was, <laughs> I think your previous question got to the root of what I was going to ask. And um, basically, I just wanted to say that uh, I understand that the bipartisan infrastructure law added the requirement for uh, the committee, the safety committee, joint labor management safety committee at a time when Metro was already working very hard to implement um, SMS. And I mostly you've answered this question, but I just want to reiterate that I think it's really important for this committee to be really integrated in the SMS process um, and not sort of a layered on top and kind of existing in some kind of separate sphere that's just a, just to check the federal box. <clears throat> Um, so I appreciate that. And if I heard you correctly, it sounded like the committee will be meeting again in August. Is that right? And then will it be will have regular meetings going forward after that? The committee meets monthly. Uh, their okay. first meeting was last month and they have a meeting scheduled this month to formalize um, the charter and next steps and their ongoing schedule. They'll be updating the executive safety committee in August. In addition to their internal meeting, they're going to give a progress update and any feedback or input relative to the agency safety plan before uh, we bring the agency safety plan before the board in September. Great, and I know that initially they're working on the employee reporting, um, updating those um, procedures, uh, which is very important, obviously, in the whole SMS framework. And does the, that committee have a work plan ongoing beyond that issue as well? It does. Uh, that committee will, we've, we've assigned responsibility for uh, custody and stewardship of our safety culture survey to that committee. Um, so that committee is now working very closely with MITRE to ensure that the survey is appropriately structured and deployed and to encourage engagement of our workforce. They will be tasked with identifying any improvement efforts or proposals for programs coming out of that ongoing safety and engagement uh, survey effort with MITRE. So they are now um, working jointly with the Metro management team to own the improvement program um, that we're going to deploy throughout the agency. Great, thank you. I appreciate you know, the challenge that you face in, in implementing these relatively new requirements at the same time that you're also uh, working toward the SMS approach. So thank you very much for all that you do. That's all of my questions, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Klein. Mr. Zappi. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Ms. Impostato, for your leadership here and, and for all of your team's work on this uh, review um, and the, the transparency that you've provided here. Uh, it really it, it excited to see these actions are being taken immediately. Um, uh, and in particular, these in-process actions, I think, are also really important, especially looking at the, the quality and the effectiveness of the training we're providing, you know, in addition to whether or not uh, the operators are certified. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the timeline for that review and when you think we would have um, recommendations for how to improve the existing training. Absolutely. So um, we will be, our intent is to generate recommendations on a rolling basis. Um, we don't want to wait um, for a comprehensive review to be fully finished before we start implementing any opportunities for improvement that we see. Um, the long lead items will likely be the organizational design, as well as the development of a simulator program. Um, but the shorter, probably by the close of the calendar year, um, timeline events will be independent oversight, first cut of key performance indicators, decisions with regard to fleet planning, as well as um, the benchmarking. 
We think realistically with the benchmarking, we should be able by year end um, to have identified some best practices that are immediately applicable and adoptable, as well as those that will require some longer term strategic decisions and investments. Um, so I think in terms of timeline to deliver a substantive update, I think um, end of calendar year 22, beginning of calendar year 23, uh, we should be positioned as an agency to give the board a full accounting of all of the changes that we've subsequently made and those changes that we have um, in progress and planned. Perfect, that's great, thanks. Um, just one, one last question. For the training that was subject to the waiver, um, who typically performs that training? Are they dedicated instructors? Or are they operators that perform or lead training in addition to um, their, their day job? It's a number of individuals. It's multiple departments. Uh, the classroom portion of the training are dedicated trainers who perform most technical training throughout Metro. Uh, they have the relevant qualifications and experience as former operators to do so. The practical demonstrations portion of the training and certification program is led by an independent um, oversight QA, QC team within rail operations. It reports up through different vice presidents in the organization. Uh, that team has nine dedicated individuals who perform that final um, direct observation under operating conditions sort of test. That's one of the things that we're looking at because so many parties are involved reporting up through uh, multiple hierarchies. We believe that um, this incident highlighted gaps and inconsistencies in mm. scheduling and execution. And I mean, th we think that's something we need to consider moving forward. Got it. OK, thanks so much. Well, one quick clarification, the the training portion of it did continue um, shortly after the uh, pandemic you know, began in March 2020. So just for a note of clarification, it was the recertification that lagged so far behind. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Zappi. Dr. Helfer. Thank you. And um, just quick, and, and I apologize if I missed this, uh, just clarification, Teresa, thank you for all your work and really appreciate grounding in the process and building the culture and that that takes time. But in the meantime, um, have, are there any, um, is there anything in place that, uh, you know, now for recertification or decisions for waivers has to come to you before any um, any supervisor can approve it. Um, and I apologize if I missed that trigger, that tier, like automatic um, has to be signed off at a higher level. Yes, um, so they must come to the Metro Safety Standards Committee. Any deviations from existing training and certification plans or deviations from Metro standards need to come to the Safety Standards Committee. My team chairs that committee, um, and it is comprised of representatives across operations as well as the independent uh, quality team. So Great. all discussions will be vetted, recorded, and the state oversight sits as an observer on that committee, so they'll know as well. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate the clarification. Thank you, Dr. Helfer. So again, um, uh, Teresa, thank you very much for an energizing uh, presentation. Uh, you really provided a great update today and, and thanks to the board members uh, for the um, very informative dialogue and, and back and forth as we uh, address to where we're going in the future. With uh, no further business to come before the committee, uh, we will stand adjourned. And I'll turn the floor over to Mr. Letourneau to begin the finance and the finance and capital committee meeting. Thank you, Mr. Drummer. Good morning and welcome to today's finance and capital committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. Our first order of business is to approve the agenda. If there are no objections, we'll consider the agenda approved as presented. Are there any objections by members of the committee to the agenda? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. Now on to the minutes. We have the minutes of our March 10th meeting. Are there any objections to the minutes as presented? Hearing none, we'll consider the minutes approved as presented. We only have one item uh, on the Finance Committee agenda 
today, which is uh, that we're being asked to authorize a public hearing regarding changes to transit facilities at the Tacoma Metro Rail Station in conjunction with a proposed joint development at the station. I'll turn the floor over to Stephen <coughs> Segerlin, Director of Real Estate and Station Area Planning. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Board Member Letourneau. Let me share my screen with the slides. Can you confirm that you can see them? Yes, I can. As mentioned, today we seek board approval to hold a compact public hearing to reconfigure transit facilities and access to the Tacoma Metro Station. This project has had a long history going back to 1999 when the board approved the issuance of a joint development solicitation. That led to the selection of EYA development and later approval of a joint development agreement. Subsequently, two compact public hearings were held to consolidate and reduce parking facilities. However, development progress was delayed at those times due to the financial crisis and clarifications needed regarding the development allowances for the site. In 2021, the DC Council adopted updates to the comprehensive plan that not only clarified but also increase the development allowances at Tacoma Metro Station. In regards to the existing site and facility, there are nine bus bays and 160 kiss and ride spaces that comprise of metered, non-metered ADA and motorcycle spaces. After the adoption of the DC Comprehensive Plan, EYA development replanned the site and now proposes a program that includes 350 to 400 housing units and to set aside 15% of those housing units to be affordable to families earning 30 to 60% of the area median income. The project will also include 16,000 square feet of retail. This development program is a, a significant increase over the 2015 comprehensive plan by nearly 150 to 200 units and is, is consistent with the District of Columbia's future land use vision for this location. To enable the building program, the project proposes to relocate the bus loop closer to the metro station and tracks while retaining egress and ingress capacity for Eastern Ave and Carroll Street uh, as it does today. It also proposes to expand the number of bus space from 9 and to 10 in order to manage the amount of bus service that occurs at this station and is anticipated in the future. The project also proposes to add a new traffic signal at the main entrance to the bus loop in order to improve safe operations and of the facility and access for pedestrians and bicyclists. Lastly, the project proposes to reduce the number of kiss and ride spaces from 160 to 16. Staff believe that this is reasonable because we have found that the utilization of the kiss and ride facility has lower levels and that the majority of use that is occurring exceeds uh, eight hours in duration, which is uh, similar to the usage of our park and ride facilities and would be better accommodated at the Fort Totten park and ride uh, that is less than 10 minutes away from the Tacoma Metro Station, that this facility would prioritize that focus on short-term kiss and ride pickup and drop off. As for the compact public hearing, WMATA's compact requires outreach to seek, seek feedback about proposed changes to the transit facilities from 
Metro customers and commuters, residents surrounding the Metro station, and users of the road network. The compact public hearing is anticipated to be held in fall of 2022, and staff may return to the board to seek approval of a compact public hearing staff report and amendments to the mass transit plan in winter of 2022 or 2023. So in conclusion, our recommendation is for board approval to hold a compact public hearing to reconfigure transit facilities and access to the Tacoma Metro Station. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Yeah, 160 kiss and ride spaces really seems excessive, um, and I was kind of surprised um, that we have a facility like that. I can understand why it typically just gets used for parking. Um, I see we have, uh, I was going to ask the members of the committee to raise questions if you have any. Um, I am only seeing that Dr. Lowe has a question, so let's go to her. Hi, Mike. My question is if we know anything about the phasing of the project so far, because to me, uh, I, I sort of share um, Matt's assessment of the the amount of kissing <laughs> necessary to operate this station. But um, the bigger issue is the relocation of the bus base. Um, so <clears throat> do we know anything yet about how we're going to phase this in order to seamlessly provide bus service to all of the lines that use those bays? Do we, is it going to be seamless? <laughs> Yes, uh, we, we do, and the plan is for the bus facilities and the new kiss and ride facilities to be constructed first before the building so that there can be an immediate transition from the old bus facilities to the new bus facilities. And then after that point, then the building program could occur because uh, the proposed building location is where the existing bus loop is today. So yeah, that relocation but would have to occur. Yeah, that slide made that really clear. So I just wanted to understand that 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 that's how it should be phased. I'm glad to hear that what should ha be happening is happening. Um, I consistently receive complaints from folks in Tacoma about the lighting in the current bus bay facilities. I gather that there's some kind of like, you know, like serious structural issue with it and. My guess would be that like we haven't fixed it because we're about to tear it down and build all these new bus bays. But I just want to flag that like big picture that like you know like deferring maintenance like that and and the extraordinary timeline in terms of like how long this has gone on has really like reduced trust in in Momada in this immediate neighborhood. That like the words that we're going to do things properly, so um, it is imperative that the first part of this project be a new state of the art bus facility with like no jury rigging and like real electricity, and we we really need to do that not only because it's the right thing from a service perspective, but because that's it's past very past due just from a trust and customer service perspective. Uh, much appreciated on the comments and we can coordinate with the WMATA staff and departments about the lighting conditions now, um, but we do hear that comment often as part of the joint development planning. Um, so that is definitely a priority. I think for the, the developers as well, that the area is is well lit and activated so that it feels safe and comfortable um, for both their residents, our customers, and the community um, at all times of the day. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Klein. Uh, two, two quick questions. Um, thank you for this. It looks like a really exciting project. I'm glad it'll be moving forward, hopefully, after a long time. Um, one question is, what kind of barrier or 
uh, mitigation or signage, et cetera, will be in place to encourage people to cross not through the bus bay to the station, but at that traffic signal. Because the way that the way it's laid out, it looks as though there might be natural pedestrian tendencies to take an unsafe route to the station from the residential area. Uh, yes, we, we've heard some of those comments as well. And so through the design process, I think we'll be considering a combination of um, signage and in some cases fencing, but also thinking about uh, landscaping um, that will be used to um, provide an, an intuitive path to the metro station um, and the direction of travel that was most safe. Great. I figured that was on the radar, but I just thought I'd raise it. <laughs> so what jumped out to me when I looked at the plan um, and can you say a little bit more about, so what is WMATA's role with regard to those types of things? W where, where does, where does um, your, your work kind of end and then the development project begin? I know this is a joint development. Is, is all of the land owned by WMATA there uh, that we're talking all about? All of the land is owned by WMATA. Um, and so the Office of Real Estate and Parking, as well as all of the other metro departments, have a, a strong role viewing and approving the developers not only concept plans that they will use to then um, coordinate with the district to secure their entitlements um, but even going down to their building and construction plans uh, and approving those to make sure that they meet out of design criteria manual requirements any other um, requirements we identified to ensure of safe operations for uh, our services in full. Great, sounds good. Thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none then, um, I will move um, approval of the motion to authorize the hearing. Is there a second by a member of the committee? Second. Thank you, Ms. Klein. Uh, I will ask the board secretary to call the roll. Thank you, uh, Chair Letourneau. Aye. Mr. Zappi. Aye. Ms. Klein. Aye. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. And with no further business to come before the committee, we stand adjourned. I will turn the floor over to Chair Smedberg, who has a request that the board convene in executive session. Thank you, Mr. Letourneau. Um, give me just one moment. Um, in accordance with the bylaws, I, Paul Smedberg, request that the Board of Directors convene an executive session to discuss the following matters pursuant to Article 2, Paragraph 9, Subsections B, litigation, investigations, and other legal matters requiring provision or legal advice or consultation with council and staff members and C, personnel or labor issues involving uh, or including discussions of labor contracts, labor negotiations, consideration of interviews of candidates for employment and the assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion or resignation of individuals and D, contractual or other matters involving confidential or proprietary concerns or the investment of public funds where discussion in public would adversely affect the financial interest of WMATA, and G, uh, disposition of WMATA property or acquisition of real property for WMATA purposes where discussion in public would adversely affect WMATA's negotiation or bargaining position. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Dr. Lowe. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. All right, thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we'll reconvene in exec session in one moment. Thank you.